everyone. I'm Trisha Bell. Hi, I'm Georgie Young. And welcome to CTE Talk, a podcast where we talk all about CTE, concussion culture and sport, and life as a family member. Every Monday, we will be joined by guests to shed light on the neurological disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Join us on our mission to raise awareness and educate others. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to CTE Talk. This morning, um, we will be talking with Cindy Fiesel, who was married to Grant Fiesel, who played in the NFL and um, had passed away, has passed away, and was posthumously diagnosed with CTE. And Cindy has written a book. I don't remember what year it was. <clears throat> Excuse me, Cindy. Um, but go ahead and introduce yourself and, and tell us your CTE story today. Hi. Um, thank you for having me, first of all. I appreciate it. And yes, I did write a book documenting as many things as I could possibly remember and had written down. Um, it's called After the Cheering Stops. And again, it was never written for, you know, money as much as just to say, is anybody else out there? Has anybody gone through this? I was, it was like a, a megaphone call, you know, somebody answer the call. <laughs> Did anybody go through anything like this? I was hoping that people would start responding back to me. And um, it's been a constant responding back to me. Um for the last five years, people have contacted me and pretty much on a regular basis. And mm -hmm. there's hardly a week that goes by, sometimes not more than a day that goes by that somebody reaches out to me on Facebook or uh, contacts me over um, an email and just has a story that sounds very similar to mine in a lot of ways. So um, I've just been shocked and amazed over these years that everybody that's come to me has had a streamlined similarity. And so I, I feel like that it was definitely worth the, worth the time that it took to do it and to write it. I'll never regret it. Um, some people thought that I was a terrible person because I aired my quote unquote dirty laundry in front of the whole world. <laughs> but uh, my world was a mess. And so um, it would have been crazy for me to have tried to make it sound better than it was because there were a lot of unanswered questions over the 29 years that I was married to Grant that make perfect sense now. And, um, you know, he's been dead since 2012. So I've had a lot of time to reflect. I've had a lot of time to compare stories with other women. And I've had a lot of time just to do my own research. And uh, it's just been amazing to me. I, I didn't even know what trauma was. <laughs> I thought trauma was something that people went through that, you know, got shot or um, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't really know if I knew what the definition of that was. We hear a lot more about trauma now than we used to, right? People didn't mm -hmm. really talk about trauma. Oh yeah. All the time. I feel like we, we hear about yeah. it. Yeah. And so that word to me was kind of a, I don't know. It was a, a buzzword that I had just not used a lot and I didn't know the definition of it. And, and now I look at my family of five and I think, uh, okay, we lived through a lot of trauma and each person in my family went through different things. You know, I was going through things as a spouse, Grant was going through things as the person that was brain damaged. And because he was a brain damaged addict, he caused a lot of trauma in our family. And my kids are all grown and I don't have a relationship with my oldest son just because of all of this, which I hope that someday I can recover. But the other two and I talk about pretty much on a daily basis. Wow, <laughs> we're still standing because um, it was brutal. I mean, that's the only word for it. It was brutal. And we were also living in a time where everybody tried to fake that they were okay. You know, remember the 80s and 90s? Mm. Everybody pretended they were okay because nobody was talking about trauma and nobody was talking about therapy. Nobody was talking about brain damage <laughs> unless, mm. your, unless your child was just born with brain damage. We weren't really talking about the fact that um, I had never heard that you could get brain damage by being hit in the head by playing a sport. Now I knew you could, if you'd been in car accidents and maybe if somebody took your head and smashed it against a wall a couple of times, you know, but 
I had never heard that you could get brain damage by playing a headbanging sport. I mean, Grant was a pre-med major. He, he was um, super smart. He never made anything below a A minus in his entire life, I guess. And so, um, gee, he was in all of the classes to get into to pre-med and nobody ever told him that the brain was soft like an egg, like an egg yolk. <laughs> You'd be surprised, I mean, Cindy. Still so many people don't know I that. Know. I know it just I sorry to laugh but I have to laugh I, I to keep from crying I have to laugh that we were all so uneducated I have a master's degree he was a, a pre-med major I mean we were smart people <laughs> yeah and yet we didn't it never crossed our mind and so we lived this disconnected life because we had no information and uh, I don't think that he ever thought, maybe he did at the very, very end, but I don't know that he ever thought. We never made the connection that the addiction was because of his brain trauma. I mean, and gosh, now every story you read about somebody having a brain injury, addiction goes hand in hand with that. Mm. And we'd never even thought about it. So, I mean, Grant died and we never thought about any of this. He said at the very end, you know, I think I may have what my cat. And I was like, my who? And what, what is that? <laughs> he was talking about Mike Webster, who I hadn't really put a lot of thought into how Mike had died because I hadn't researched it. And remember that was, you know, really before people started Googling everything. It was right at the beginning of all the information age when Grant died. And so uh, really, I didn't have any way of knowing other than he did tell me it was called CTE and that, um, you know, he thought maybe that that's what he had. And he said, I had a lot of concussions. And I said, you did? We never even talked about it. He said, yes. And I remember saying how many, and he thought about it for a few minutes and he said hundreds. Mm. Mm. I mean, so literally it's like I lived for 29 years with somebody I didn't know. <laughs> and and he slowly but surely became aggressive, a pill user, a drunk. I mean, again, people that love and know him don't want me to say these things about him, but I have to say the truth. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I mm -hmm. can't lie about that. He was a beautiful soul. And, and, but people that are addicts are hard to live with. And people that have brain damage are hard to live with. And he had both. And he, you know, it caused us all to have, um, just a lot of, we were, we never knew which grant we were going to get, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, beautiful person turned into this person that nobody knew. Um, you can't give your spouse and you can't give your children the things they need when you have an addiction combined with brain damage. And Grant was, you know, he had stage three CTE that's documented by the Boston University. So, um, you know, there's only four stages. Yeah. And I don't think it matters if you have one, two, three, or four. You're not the same person that you used to be. So uh, a lot of uh, reflection time that I've had now these years that he's been gone. But um, I, I've learned more. And I've let go of a lot of the anger that I had towards him because, you know, I was just mm -hmm. mad. At him. I mean, he ruined our life. <laughs> and I thought I was going to have, a, you know, a more perfect life. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I know people have other things that cause them to not have a perfect life. But um, I, I know that things can't be perfect. But, you know, he was a great sweet, kind person. I thought I married somebody that ended up being totally different than who he ended up being, but it was out of his control. And I could have had more compassion for him if I'd known the correlation of his illnesses. Um, hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, you can't, you can't go back. You can only go forward. Right. So right. The, 
best thing for me to do is to talk to, on these podcasts and and write the book and do the things that um, can get the message out of what this really does in a family because it doesn't just destroy the person it destroys everybody in the family and the wife <laughs> it messes with everybody mm -hmm. and so um you know, you'd like to rewind but I don't know if I even rewound I don't think I I, I couldn't fix him he was unfixable I still think we would have gotten a divorce because he was mad at me all the time I couldn't ever do enough to make him happy mm -hmm. and he uh you know he, he irritated me because he was either taking pills or drinking all the time that was irritating to me and you can't have a life with that I mean <laughs> you can I guess but I I probably should have moved out but I tried to stay you know how you are when um well I don't know if, I'm just saying this is what addicts spouses do they try to control everybody. You know, that's what it turns into. <laughs> that and codependency so, yeah. Um, model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't really even know what a codependent was. And if I'd known more about my own condition, I could have handled it different. But again, back in the 80s and 90s, when people weren't even talking about any of this stuff, it was really hard to get any information about what you should do. And Grant was never diagnosed with even a CTE symptom. And he had every symptom there was. I mean, literally, he was paranoid. He couldn't, he was depressed. He had short term memory loss. He had emotional instability. He was irritable, aggressive. He had speech problems, motor impairment, vision problems. Mm. I mean, good grief. He had every CTE symptom that the, C, that the Mayo Clinic had on their website when I finally looked three years after he died. Mm. Cindy, you, you, you talked about, um, if I could ask a question, you talked about it's been so many years since Grant has passed and you've had, mm -hmm. done a lot of reflecting. Mm -hmm. When did you first start to notice the changes? I mean, that was a long period of time that you were married. Yes. So you have a long history of watching somebody go from this person. Yes. Yeah. So yes. what was that like? How did that it manifest? Was I call it a slow fade, you know, like when you're standing on the beach and the water comes up and just slowly but surely starts eroding maybe your footprint that you put in there. So it was a slow fade and it wasn't fast because I think if it had been fast, that would have been more like, what, what happened? You know, but you just keep on living with the slow fade, right? Mm -hmm. So it was the ebb and flow that I kept living with and um, noticing that there were a lot of just changes in his temperament because he was, had been such an easygoing. Now he wasn't that way on the football field, but with me and with everybody else, he was just gentle and kind and sweet and um, just, you know, so his behavior became so untypical of what he was, but it was slow. It didn't happen fast. It was slow. And I, it would ha it was so slow that sometimes I would think it was me, you know, like what's mm -hmm. wrong with me. And then one day my daughter said to me, she said, it's our house, our home isn't like everybody else's. And I was, I reflected on that one for a long time. She was probably eight. And I thought, wow, I thought I'd been doing such a good job of hiding Grant's sporadic behavior. <laughs> you know, he spent a lot of isolation time. Hmm. He didn't want to be um, with, the family at Christmas, he could only ha handle so much. And then he had to like isolate. He had to go back to the bedroom or his office or whatever. But he, uh, he isolated a lot, which made me feel, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. You know, I thought something was wrong with me. <laughs> so I, I, for a while, it took me, it took me a long time to figure out it wasn't me. It was him because he would isolate, but while he was isolating, he was drinking. Right. And so the, the drinking and the pill taking, it became more obvious. He tried to hide all of that for years, you know, like mask it within Gatorade bottles and all sorts of things, just those crazy things that people do that are trying to hide. But it took me a while to catch on to that. So, you know, it was years. By that time, years just kept fading out more and more. And um, so, and you're you know, busy raising three kids and, you yeah. know, you, it's, I mean, you're, yeah. You can't notice everything. And, no. Yeah. 
No, and I took a job because our finances had gotten to be, you know, like scary to me. I mean, Grant always had a good job, but all of a sudden I was like, I didn't know where the money was going. And I was just, I, I don't know, the financial part was a big question to me. I couldn't figure, nothing was making sense with that. And the kids were all in private school. So I took a job to where I could work at their school and it would pay for their tuition. And, you know, that was helpful. But I would say financial was one of the first things too, that I was like, none of this is adding up. And um, so a lot of isolation time, drinking more and more. I remember he came into one of our, our oldest son played on the basketball team and he came in uh, and in the middle of the game and he had been work and he leaned over and he kissed me on the cheek. And I just was like, I just turned to him and I said, have you been drinking? This was like on a Tuesday night you know, and like five o'clock, <laughs> it floored me. I, I just remember thinking, okay, now that is wild. I, you know, just your train of thought, like why would, why is he doing this on a weeknight? Why is he doing this to the point where I can smell it? If I can smell it, everybody's going to be able to smell it. You know, it was those kind of things that started being happening more and more often. And that was our oldest child who was then in eighth grade and we had two younger children. So everybody was pretty young when Grant was already mentally gone. You know, I mean, he, he couldn't, he couldn't balance work and being a dad and being a, a husband and it, he couldn't balance anything. So his answer for everything was to isolate. I don't think he could stand the noise. You know, now that the research that I've done um, tells me that, you know, the noise bothers people that have brain trauma. And I think that, you know, if it was, if the music was loud or if there was loud anywhere we were, I think it bothered him. So I think it was easier for him to stay quiet than it was to be in a crowd of people. He didn't like to be with any of the family. Mm -hmm. and my family was like, what happened to Grant? over the years, you know, mm -hmm. he didn't want to go to any of our family functions. He didn't, if he did, he took his own car because he wanted to leave early because he could only handle so much, you know, and then he needed to be gone. So, uh, <sighs> it, it was a lot. It was a lot at the same time, you know, I was trying to be the mom and the dad to the kids and that's not normal. You can't, do that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't telling the truth to anyone, my family, uh, my kids. I just, I mean, who was I supposed to tell this to? I didn't know anybody in the world who had gone through anything similar. And I couldn't put the pieces together myself, much less to tell somebody else. And nobody was going to therapy in the eighties and nineties. <laughs> I mean, that I knew of. Maybe they were, but I didn't have any friends that were. All of my friends were acting like they didn't have any problems, you know, that, so I kind of, I didn't know what, I didn't know what to do with everything. I mean, finally the, I couldn't juggle all the balls anymore. And Grant had pretty much totally, completely eliminated me from his life. So were you still living together at the, yeah. was there a, we were and how old living, were you when you got together? How old, when did you uh, start? We were in college. We were in college yeah. and we got married when we were our senior year. Well, it was his uh, junior year, my senior year in college. And so um, we got married in our twenties or 20, 21, super early. <laughs> and um, I, after 27 years, you know, I pretty much was like, I mean, he was done with me. I mean, totally done with me. And um, we just fought a lot. We fought a lot. He stayed drunk most of the time. And uh, I never knew where he was. I mean, he would call me and say he was in New York and uh, on business. And there would go days, sometimes weeks. I wouldn't know where he was. It was a real bad time. And during all that, our kids had their own things, you know, because the kids will miss their dad. And so, you know, when you don't have a family unit, everybody falls apart, kind of. I mean, 
everybody's trying to deal with where's dad and why isn't he ever around? And, uh, you know, especially the ones that are more sensitive, you know, I mean, mm. sometimes the kids just go on and live their life, but I found that even those still have issues and, um, it's a daughter needs her dad when there's yeah. no, a son needs mm -hmm. their dad. We have two boys and a girl and they all needed their dad. And I was not enough, you know, I was, um, yeah. you couldn't I do tried. it all. Yeah. You couldn't no, do it all. no. What, what was his response when you kind of started questioning, like what, why are you out drinking or why aren't you replying to me or whatever mm. it may be kind of, was he able to process that and give you a response or was it just um, completely disregarded? No, by that time, by the time that he was doing that, because for a long time, he would just come in from work and he'd be drunk. And so he did that for years and then he would drink more and then he would be passed out at night. You know what I mean? And then when anybody tried to talk to him, he was, you know, rambling and out of it. And um, so, you know, that went on for a long time. And then uh, by the time he was not showing up, I just didn't know where he was or he'd be gone for days and I wouldn't know where he was. It was like it, it, he was mad at me. And so we just had a lot of, combustible <laughs> anger a lot of a lot of anger because I felt like I deserved more than that and he felt like I didn't deserve anything and so um you know again not really anybody that I know he didn't talk to anybody about it and I didn't and um so you know I mean it finally just got to the point for me where I was like I would, I started going to therapy. So I did have a therapist and I was trying to navigate all of the fact that I was a codependent <laughs> and try to navigate all of that with my, with my three kids and my alcoholic drug addict husband. And so it got to pre be pretty much, um, for me mentally. And so, um, I would, I mean, for lack of a better word, I'm, I'm just going to say that I had a breakdown mentally <laughs> it wasn't pretty so my kid said an alcoholic pill taken dad and a mentally incompetent mom uh, now I'm not going to blame that on Grant, but I'm going to say that, you know, years of that kind of condition mm -hmm. <laughs> wore me down to the point where just because, again, I love and adore my kids, but they were super needy because they needed a dad, you know, they needed their dad and they needed me and I loved their dad. And I was trying to save their dad, right? <laughs> I loved them too, but you know, it just turns into a big old hamster wheel. Yeah. And it's a, I don't know how any of us listen, my son, my youngest son and my daughter, and I talk about it regular. We say, how did we live through this? because it was scary. It was scary. Grant was scary. We thought any day he was going to be dead. He had reckless behavior, driving drunk. Mm -hmm. Let's just say I go to bed every night and I just thank God that he's at peace now. And I don't have to deal with that because he was hard to deal with. And I said it in the book and I've said it on other podcasts too. If, if I had laid down behind his car, he would have run over me. He was um, unmanageable. Yeah. <laughs> and the sweetest, nicest, kindest person that I had ne ever known I would have never married anybody that wasn't wonderful. 
and he was wonderful. And that disease took somebody wonderful and made them into somebody very scary. So I have the most empathy for anybody that's living through a hellish nightmare, whether it be your son or your husband or any loved one, because they can't see it and you can't fix it. And you can't really get a lot of medical information because there's not a lot. Now they're saying they can tell people what the symptoms are. Well, you can also get that off of a website, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I, I got all of those symptoms off of the uh, Mayo Clinic website, but I don't know anybody that has been healed from CTE. Mm. People want to contact me and tell me that they have all sorts of therapies they want me to talk about and all sorts of this and that, but I'm not a doctor and I'm never going to recommend anything because I'm just going to tell the raw truth about what happened in my family. And um, I just always say to parents, you read all the reviews on Amazon about anything you want, including an iPhone, tennis shoes. <laughs> Why wouldn't you read the reviews about what happens to your precious children if you put them in a sport that bangs their brain. So I, I don't want my kids, my, my grandkids to be in the middle of a highway trying to navigate, not getting hit. I mean, <laughs> if you are playing a sport where you're getting your head bashed, then the likelihood is that something, whether it's ALS or dementia or Parkinson's or CTE, I mean, there's just, there's all these brain diseases that you can get and it, and it makes it more likely. So mm -hmm. <laughs> why would you want to intentionally put your children in that position? Mm -hmm. And some of them in Texas where I live are playing from the time they're five years old. So young, isn't it? So young. And I know we had a, a story last week where obviously the person was affected at such a young age, but yes. honestly, it really it, it is so dangerous. And Trisha it's and I so said this before, your brain isn't developed until no. your mid twenties. So, yeah. I mean, you do have to really, really look after it. Yes. And I have two sons and they both played um, football from the time they were about eight years old. They played through college. Both of them had serious um concussions during their years that they played one of mine had a skull fracture not from mm. playing football but he he had a skull fracture from an accident and so all of those hits you know they all they all accumulate I mean every hit parents don't understand that they say oh the rules are different now and they're different than the NFL you know they're not allowed to hit in the head or whatever okay well it's like shaking it doesn't matter you know, I mean, shaking the brain, whether it's in practice or a game, it's not a good idea. And Grant played from age eight to 32. He was the center most of his career, which took a lot of hits to the head. And then he did all the deep snapping um, in his professional career. And so every time he, there were extra points and field goals, his head was smashed down and he had a burning stinging sensation in his neck almost always mm -hmm. uh every everything in his body burned he would talk about burning stinging um he couldn't stand to even turn his head you know in the car because if he turned it a certain way then it would sting all down an arm and down his back and um you know even when he was in college they were giving him um muscle relaxers uh his drug of choice, you know, that he really got hooked on in the NFL. So, I mean, they, they drove the drug addiction with him was Percocet and Vicodin. Mm -hmm. and so uh, at the time, you know, I always laugh and say, I didn't have pillfinder.com. I didn't know what that was. I thought it was a, what, a, a Tylenol or aspirin. I had no idea. He would just bring these little bags in and say, um, you know, they would just help with the pain. 
So um, that was going on for years before he quit playing in the NFL. And then, you know, they get out of the NFL and they don't get a prescription. (laughs) And I know they have doctors on the sidelines and people want to say, yeah, well, there's a medical doctor out there. Well, the medical doctor isn't telling the truth or he couldn't be a a medical doctor. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because if he was a real concerned medical doctor, he would say, you know what? They don't need to be doing this. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's a lot of money and prestige. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for those people that do that, it's money and power, just like money and power in the NFL playing. And it's all wrapped around money. Mm-hmm. If you were to ask him, if you saw yourself, how you kind of ended up, would you, do you think he'd take back playing all that years in professional sport? Or do you think he'd still say I'd do it? Well, I've thought about that and people have asked me this on multiple interviews and I have said, I think that, um, cause I know he enjoyed watching it all, you know, all, even when up until he died, he enjoyed watching it. Um, I think that he would say if it, if it had meant losing me and our kids, he would have never done it. Definitely. Um, I just know that he, he loved us. And I don't think, again, I don't think he had any idea until like the very end, he said to me and I wrote it down. Um, I didn't, I, the thing that I loved the most would end up killing me. You know, I mean, he didn't have any idea that the, the sport had driven all of this. And so um, I think that definitely he loved us more than the sport. So if he thought that there was going to, if he'd had to make a decision, he would have said, no, because Grant was smart. He was going to medical school Mm -hmm. and he'd been accepted into every medical school and every dental school in the state of Texas. He could have gone either way, done either, either one. And he chose to play football. (laughs) So now I think in 2023, if, if he just, let's say we were just getting out of college in 2023 and somebody said, you know what, we're going to draft you in the fifth round. And so you're going to get a chance to play professional football. I think now with all the information that we know now, he would say, you know what? I'm going to medical school because I want to still be as healthy as I can be for my three children and spend as much time with them as I can and my wife. Yeah. Because that was that was the kind of person he was. He was a great guy. And I know he loved me. And I know he loved our kids more than anything else. But see, he thought he was doing what was right by playing football and making money and uh he thought that would be a good deal you know but in 2023 i think there's just a lot more information than there was then and so i i I have a hard time with people that continue to play in this uh late date with all this information and think for whatever reason that they're not going to get it Mm. yeah back then you there was no information to base a decision on whereas now like you said the options are there people can pick a or b Um, yeah yeah, it's just crazy to me though because for us I think we all probably see it as it's just not worth it really is it is do you love the sport that much is it that worth it but for some people whether they're because it's on they're uneducated they don't know anyone affected Mm -hmm. but to them they just don't see that perspective and I just don't know what the solution to that is I don't either and again I feel I'm not trying to be um I guess, hard-hearted when I say I'm just tired of, I'm not going to um, just keep on talking to people that already have their mind made up about something, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, and again, I'm saying I love my family, but all of my family continues to watch football and they have a dead family member. How do you do that? (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if, if my family is not willing to give up football, then I mean, neither, there's nobody out there that would. I mean, just the majority of the people in the United States of America think that this is like the most glitziest, glamorous lifestyle in America and that you've reached the epitome of the guys club if you make it there. And um, it's a killer is what it is. And some people may not end up, well, I've even heard this recently, this blew my mind. Sometimes some of the uh, old time players in Dallas, let's say that played years and years ago, it had come out in the news that, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so died and they were like in their eighties and they died of dementia. 
or Parkinson's or whatever. And I'll think to myself, well, I know why. And I've said stuff like that to other people. And they've said, he was 82. Like, big deal. Well, but those diseases are slow rolling. You don't just wake up and have one of those one day. Everybody that was in that person's life had to be affected by that. Whether it was mm -hmm. 10 years before, five years before, somebody helped take care of this person that was incapacitated. Mm -hmm. And that's the what that's the reason they were <laughs> because of head injuries. Mm -hmm. And people don't even get it. I mean, people still don't get that at all. They think that's like totally unrelated. And they'll say, oh, well, he only played football in high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like nobody gets it. You can and you can get it without even playing sport. I mean, yes. that summarize the, yes. the answers to that question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, I, I don't know. I just kind of have tried to be. I want to give people a lot of information, but I found that people didn't want to hear a lot of my information. Mm -hmm. And so I was really gung ho there for for years when I first realized all of this started coming together for me. And I realized, um, hey, I can say something and maybe some people will listen. But I found that the majority of the people were like, eh, than they yeah. were. <laughs> I do think in I do think in this situation, like there's greater value in telling information to the one person that wants to listen compared to telling it to 10 people who don't want to yeah. don't want to listen yeah. to it at all yes yes and there are people that like I say come to me and they'll come to me in privacy and I totally respect that because they'll say you know my loved one is acting like this and he played football for 10 years and what do you think and you know so I, I I'm glad that I can be a person that can agree with someone, mm -hmm. because I was looking for someone to agree with me and I didn't even know who to go to, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm always thrilled that there's a lot of really great reviews on my book on Amazon because people look at those reviews and they contact me and they'll say, I just saw what everybody was saying on Amazon. And I'm thinking, okay, well, if that's how they found me, that's awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thrilled, you know? So I'm thrilled for every single person that comes to me and every single person that wants to do a, an interview. I'm thrilled because I feel like that's my way of getting out the information mm -hmm. somewhere else, you know? So I just appreciate y'all for doing this because it's educational for people that are looking for information, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think everybody is talking about it a little bit more than they were years ago. But again, it's a slow train. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. But one day we'll, we were, we'll all look back and we'll be like, we were such a part of kind of this yeah. develop this development. And even for me, for example, I obviously was not involved in the years of the 80s and early 90s. But for me, I, I'm more immersed in the CT world. I don't really know anything else rather other than kind of all this research that's happening. So mm -hmm. I think fast forward 20 plus years or whatever it may be that we're mm -hmm. definitely going to be in an even better place than we are now. Yeah, I do too. I hate that the NFL constantly is trying to put out false information. Like I have people that want to get into arguing matches with me and I refuse to argue with anyone. <laughs> My evidence stands, so I'm not arguing with anyone. Uh, but people want to get into like uh, sparring matches with me about the NFL helmets and how much better they are now and how that goes. <laughs> <to> be <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I am not going to argue with anyone <laughs> about anything. And I'm certainly not going to argue about that because that is not true. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what kind of helmet it is. And I know they've made all sorts of like caps and this, that, and the other. And people have wanted me to talk about how great they are. People want me to talk about um, waiting to play football until you're 18. I'm not going to talk about that either because I don't care if you're 18 years old, you're considered an adult in the world society. If you want to play football as an adult at 18, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to say it's okay. And you're not going to have any kind of long-term life repercussions from playing after 18. And I'm sure not going to ever say that it's going to make a difference because you used uh, some sort of cap that the NFL has come up with. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy, <laughs> isn't it? But <laughs> love is blind. Love is blinding. And I think I people's love, love for the NFL blinds the realities of CTE. And yes. I think that's the problem. 
Yes. And I just want to say this one more thing too, that I don't think most people realize that um, the NFL paid out 11 families. Okay. Over the years that died from CTE. I don't, I'm, I know that they said then they would never acknowledge that CTE was a problem and caused by football ever again. And so I don't know why people continue to say that they think they're going to get money from the NFL because it's not going to happen. I mean, they've got every legal loophole sold up. There's not anybody out there that's going to get money from the NFL. At this point, even if your loved one dies today and they get a CTE diagnosis, the NFL's not writing checks out to you. So that's why there's I'm too saying, many people now, isn't it? Yeah, there's too many people. There's too many people. So I am sad that people think in the world that somehow there's a resolution that it's okay if the NFL pays you out, that that should make a big difference in your life because that's blood money and your life is still ruined. So whatever amount they could pay somebody is not going to cover the cost of losing your loved one and losing a lifetime with your loved one. So yeah. that's just crazy to me that anybody thinks that somehow there's a dollar amount on that mm. because there's not. And um, the NFL is into making money, not giving money. <laughs> And so I just am constantly amazed that I get these letters and I get emails about all these different losses and I never hear anything about, you know, any big cash pot that's out there because they always have a loophole of how they're not, everybody should know. And so they're saying at this point that everybody should know that CTE is something that you could get by playing football. So they're not going to give anybody one dime for anything. And the few people that have gotten some sort of resolution from the NCAA, maybe some of those aren't covered uh, legally, but you don't hear about that very often either. <laughs> football, yeah. is a football is a money maker. Cities are built around football stadiums. And um, so, no, it, it's like everything else, big pharma and everything else. You know, you, you, you don't take things down like that power and money and I mean it's you can't fight that all you can do is tell your truth in your part of the world but it's a big machine mm. yes it is wow thank you so much Cindy for for being with us today um I, I have not read your book yet but I will be ordering a copy of it is it on audible um it is it is wonderful. So I, I can go ahead and listen to it. Did yeah. you read it yourself? Uh, no, no. That's I, okay. I, you know, I, I had a great person, Mike Yorkie wrote the book for me and we talked about it every day for like, I don't know, months while he was writing it. And I kept, I would write down, you know, and sequence things. And I'd kept a lot of journals and I remember just going, okay, did this really happen? <laughs> You know how now I know that trauma makes you forget, you know, mm -hmm. you forget things. And I would write things and I, I had written things and I'd look at it and I'd think, okay, that didn't really happen. And I could, I'd have to close it because I couldn't even process it again, just reading it. You know, it was so painful. And I would say to him, but I don't want to write that. I want that to sound better than it does. Can you please make that sound better than it does? And he said, Cindy, we have to tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> The truth is painful and the truth is ugly. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I just, it's awful. And, and for anybody to think that any of these families make any kind of detail up to be worse, <laughs> you don't need to. It's terrible. You don't need to make anything up. It's just downright awful. And, um, it changes their personality to the point where it's just, you know, it makes you think you're crazy. So it makes everybody think they're crazy. It's a real deep seated disease that gets into the roots and just digs down into the whole family and just destroys it. Mm. I mean, it's really evil. It's, it, it is. 
And um, so anyway, I just appreciate the opportunity for you to listen to some of us that have been through um, these painful experiences. And I just always hope and pray that people that listen somehow when it falls on people's ears, that they listen and they think, you know what? It is not worth it for me to put my child in anything that could end up in this result. Absolutely. And that if we just stop one family yeah. per episode yes. of, of that, we've done something. It's yes. all worth it for that hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. I agree. So thank y'all so much for realizing that this is real and true and for helping me and all the others share the the news about it. I appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you so you, much Cindy. for coming on and sharing. I know it's not easy to relive and, so- and speak about the story, but we do really appreciate it. And like we said, thank- it's gonna I'm sure it's gonna help so many people. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you again. And y'all have a great day. And thank you for working with me to get the right time too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> thank you so much, Cindy. We'll y'all talk have soon. A, have a great okay. day. Soon. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. This is the end of today's episode, everyone. We hope you enjoyed it. And we will see you next week, Monday, 8 o'clock for the next episode of CT Talk. See you later.